Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to another NL seminar. Today, it's my pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to introduce Sandeep Soni from Georgia Tech. Sandeep is a PhD candidate at the Georgia Institute of Technology. His research interests are in computational social sciences and digital humanities, with an emphasis on using text as data and computational linguistic methods. His PhD thesis is focused on uh, developing methods to use language change as a way to systematically infer latent influence relationships from text data. And he's currently on the job market looking for postdoc or permanent research positions. So it's, uh, we are very happy to have you Sandip. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, and everybody please join me in welcoming Sandip and enjoying his talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Moste, and thanks really for extending this invitation. Um, I spent a summer um, as an intern at USC ISI, um, I think two, three years back, um, and I'm really glad I, um, I'm back in, in this sort of virtual capacity at least. Um, so let's get started. I want to talk about uh, models of language change from diachronic text data um, in this talk. Um, and so in order to motivate um, what I mean by language change, here's sort of snippet of text taken from Bible, um, I think the 23rd Psalm, um, and it's um, you know 15th century English Bible, uh, 19th century English Bible, and you can see a mark, um, market difference between, uh, between these snippets of text. Um, and this is sort of an instance of what I what I would say is um, sort of language change that has happened over centuries. Um, and you know, it sort of like the modern way of saying the same thing um, in 21st century English, um, where at least someone said that on Reddit, um, is this like God is my dude? Um, I don't need nothing. Um, it's, it's an example where you can say like, you know, over centuries, you definitely see new words getting introduced in the vocabulary. Um, you wouldn't have made sense of what is written in 21st century English uh, in 15th century English. And we don't, I mean, I think we, we understand by context what is meant uh, in the first example, um, but it, it, is, it is challenging for us to, um, to really understand it. Um, but you can say that this kind of change that I talked about is sort of a cherry picked example. It happens over multiple centuries. And so inevitably languages change at, at that scale. Um, but that's not true. Um, so here's an example of um, the word lit, uh, which is which in itself is a variant of the word lit, um, like, like this party is lit. Um, and how that change spreads uh, in New York City as seen from Twitter data. Um, so from left to right, from top to bottom, um, you see these uh, neighborhoods in New York City um, as hotspots in terms of usage of this word lady. Um, and you see like more and more neighborhoods, neighborhoods uh, start using this particular word. Um, and all of this is uh, within the span of one year. So change happens like really rapidly um, also. But lexical change, like for example, the introduction of new words in the vocabulary is by far not the only type of change that happens. Um, so this is an example taken from uh, Maya Rudolph and David Lee's work um, a few years back, um, where they developed a model to, um, um, to get semantic shifts from data, uh, words that uh, change in meaning. Um, and an example that they highlighted um, was this word intelligence, which changes from a sort of personal or individual um, and meaning related to sort of mental ability uh, to a more collective uh, meaning the, referring to national security. Um, and this is an example of a semantic shift as seen in US Senate speeches um, over, I think, like 150 years. Um, so I think all of these are examples of language change of different type. Um, but what is interesting in understanding, um, like studying language change is that language change is, uh, is really a social process. Um, it is 
um, it has this tight interconnection with uh, demographics, with identity, um, with how you see yourself in a group, uh, with who influences you, who are you uh, exposed to, a variety of social factors like that. Um, and modeling how language changes can therefore help us understand uh, what is the meaning of these attributes um, and who is sort of, you know, leading, who is following, who is influencing, who is existing the uh, change in um, uh, language change. And those kind of things are taken as proxy of really like what are the social relations uh, uh, between people or between entities uh, that are of interest to us. Um, but language change is studied even computationally in a number of ways. Um, what this talk is going to do is to focus on um, studying it through diachronic text data. Um, so, you know, text of the form, um, you know, given in this example, where with every type of text, you have a, an associated timestamp of certain time. Um, and the advantage of um, uh, having data of this type is uh, you can consume a lot of text. Um, there are lots of NLP methods now that help us, you know, like get to specific uh, things in, in, in text. Um, and overall, um, with the ability to model large amounts of diachronic text um, and any additional metadata that could be present, um, we would be able to, in principle, reconstruct sort of latent social things that are going on. And this is not, you know, by by any means the first study of its kind. Diachronic text uh, has been used in many, many other studies, um, and they have yielded uh, many insights. Um, so with that sort of motivation that hopefully convinces that language change is sort of an interesting thing to study, and it help, and it may help us um, get to sort of the social structure. Uh, I want to focus on three studies that um, I've done um, during my PhD um, with sort of increasing level of NLP in each of the studies as I, as I go through them. Um, so the first question is, you know, like about word adoption. So new words are introduced in the vocabulary um, and then they spread um, uh, on a social network. Um, the question, or the more important question that we want to ask is which network ties are better conduits uh, for those changes? Um, and how do you model that kind of a process? Um, another question, um, when we know that uh, words change in meaning, um, we, I think there are models that can identify what uh, has changed, um, but we also want to answer the question of which documents are um, at the forefront of that change. Um, and so, you know, we can call these documents as semantically progressive. Um, and more importantly, uh, if you are able to identify what documents are progressive, um, then we also want to ask uh, what is their impact. Um, and finally, um, another question that can be asked similar to, uh, to, to the second one um, is instead of uh, answering like who is leading at a document level, can you extend that notion to um, if you have collections of documents from one particular entity, for example, a newspaper, um, then you want to say which newspapers lead or lag um, any, um, any semantic change. Um, and you can sort of um, extrapolate that to just um, say which newspapers in general lead or lag semantic changes. So uh, let me go through each of these uh, studies in brief. Um, this was uh, work done a few years ago on uh, studying the social dynamics of language change um, in online networks, uh, done with a few um, collaborators at Microsoft Future. Um, and what we wanted to do in this uh, uh, study is to test um, these three hypotheses uh, from Twitter data. Um, and so the first hypothesis is um, whether language change spreads through online social network connections at all. And so this is important because um, lots of theory in social linguistics um, focused on sort of propagation in terms of uh, geography and not so much um, in um, through social network connections. Um, and even if, uh, you know, there were exceptions to this, obviously, um, the evidence to uh, propagation through social networks uh, is um, um, is only through survey data, not not through sort of these online social networks 
um, that have come in, uh, come into existence in the last few years. Um, but you know, going forward with um, so the second or third hypothesis, then we want to say um, whether strong ties or densely embedded ties are more linguistically influential. So they act as uh, as sort of more uh, facilitating channels for the spread of new words. Um, and similarly, H3, where the local ties are more linguistically, linguistically influential. Um, and for this talk, I'm going to focus on how we can test uh, the second and third hypothesis. Um, you can check the paper later to see how we test uh, the first hypothesis. So we used um, a large scale data set to, um, to test these hypotheses. Uh, we were fortunate enough to collect uh, public messages from um, for, for an entire year um, for all users who were uh, geolocated within the US. Um, this is a total of over 4 million Twitter users. So, so the, the, any model has to scale to, the, to these many users. Um, and we, um, so sort of previous study, we um, had around 16 non-standard words um, divided into three categories, which we want to track um, over this one year period. Um, so let me tell you a little briefly about um, uh, the variables and sort of geographical locations that uh, we considered. Um, all the words that we had had strong association with major metropolitan areas. And I'll just give you a few examples um, of the type of words. Um, you know, LA, um, the example that we uh, have is PFTI. I don't know if, uh, if uh, everyone knows the meaning of PFTI. It's, uh, it stands for thanks for the invite. Um, and it's used as a sarcastic way of saying you didn't really invite me. Um, but so I think an examples of the sort phonetic spellings, um, the word ard, which uh, um, is a short way of writing all right. Um, the word hella, which uh, is another word for extremely, so like I'm, um, I'm hella bold, for example, um, and abbreviations like LLS. Um, so these are the three different categories, like phonetic spellings, lexical words, or lexical substitutions, and abbreviations. Um, and we have eight metropolitan uh, areas in our, um, that we looked at. Um, we also have access to the social network, and this is how we constructed the social network. So if you have a message which mentions, uh, which is sort of a re direct reply uh, to another Twitter user, um, but then that Twitter user replies back. So you have sort of a reciprocal um, connection. Um, then we have a reciprocal mention. Then we have a tie between uh, these two users, uh, Twitter users. And um, it's just a plot that uh, a, net, a social network constructed in this way um, follows sort of the power law or calls the heavy tail distribution characteristics. Um, and mentions network of this kind um, is sort of an easy way to construct social network. Um, but also I think there's been uh, some past work that says that this kind of uh, network is much more meaningful um, than the follower following network, uh, which can have um, lots of sort of celebrity um, celebrity accounts. Um, so just to give a brief idea, then this is how the data set uh, basically looks like. Uh, we have the social network. We have for every user, um, the location uh, in terms of the metropolitan area. And in terms of language data, we have what word was used at what time by which user. And once we have that kind of a data, um, then uh, we can start modeling every word as an event cascade, um, where every event uh, in this cascade encodes when a particular word was used and uh, who used it. So it's basically just a sequence of uh, tuples um, or sequence of pairs. Um, first uh, entry in the pair is the timestamp. The second entry is who for the, the Twitter user um, who used that word at that timestamp. Um, and so this is where sort of the modeling comes into picture. Um, we model every um, author uh, to have a specific type of uh, intensity function. So this is taken from sort of point process literature um, where this intensity function is a combination um, or really the intensity function depends on all the events that have happened in the past 
um, the events in the past uh, have sort of an excitation uh, to future events. So you're more likely to use this word if um, you've used it in the past. Um, but more importantly, um, if you look at equation one, um, this excitation increases or is dependent on um, the connections um, that are incoming to this user. So if, if uh, someone in your uh, uh, network neighborhood um, use the word, then you're more likely um, to use the word. Um, and this is, this is kind of um, st uh, standard uh, in point process uh, literature. This is the instantiation of a multivariate hop process. But um, if you look, if you remember equation one, um, the parameters of the model, these are the social network connections and how much every user who's connected to you excites you. Um, you can have in general quadratic, quadratic number of uh, 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 parameters in, in the number of authors. Um, so that's, that's a lot of um, parameters to estimate, especially if our network size is, is uh, especially the number of Twitter users that we have are, um, are in the millions. Um, so the idea that we had is uh, in order to test our hypothesis, we could uh, have shared features between each pair of individuals. Um, and so like every uh, pairwise parameter is decomposed into this sort of linear, um, um, linear decomposition of weights and features, um, where the features are again pairwise, but now you have far less number of parameters to, uh, to estimate um, instead of the um, um, instead of all pair um, parameters to estimate. But this decomposition helps us to really do um, model comparison in an efficient way. Um, so you can have now um, sort of base models, um, for example, F1 and F2 are base models where um, we're just saying that you're more likely to um, use a word in the future if you've already used it in the past. Um, and F2 is another base model where you're more likely to, um, uh, to, to use a word if uh, you share a mutual friend uh, connection. Um, and on top of that, you can keep on adding more features. Um, so like conditional on you having mutual friend, um, whether you have a strong tie or not. Uh, and strong ties are measured um, by this Adamic Adar index. Um, and similarly, if you have a mutual um, connection, um, then are you um, are you in the same metro area? So that would uh, be a way of uh, proxying for locality. Um, and to test the hypothesis um, that we had, uh, we could start with this null model. So F1 plus F2 as the only two features uh, to estimate these uh, counts. Um, and then uh, the null model plus F3 feature, the null model plus F4 feature. So just in this sort of feature abla um, ablation way of testing uh, um, or comparing models um, so that we can test our specific hypothesis. Um, and so this is what we had uh, in terms of results um, for the 16 words that, uh, that we had. Um, this plot uh, is a sort of scatter plot where we plot the frequency or the count of the words on the x-axis and the improvement over the null model on the y-axis and the dotted line is um, is the statistical significance threshold so words which have which are above the dotted line um, have had uh, uh, improvement that is um, that is statistically significant um, and you can see from this figure that uh, just adding the tie spin feature um, gives sort of more words, especially from this uh, um, lexical substitution category. Um, lots of those words have um, uh, substantial improvement, but you don't see as much improvement over um, the set of words if you're looking only at local types um, as an additional feature. So, you know, this is some evidence that linguistic influence is uh, perhaps um, exerted more through densely embedded ties, um, but uh, geographically local ties do not carry as much influence uh, as, as uh, strong ties. 
Um, and so just to summarize this part, um, you know, I didn't talk much about whether social network matters, but the answer is, uh, you know, it does. Um, authors are likely to use a new word if uh, their friends have um, exposed them uh, with the new word. Um, but uh, strong ties have much more influence. Uh, close friends have more linguistic influence. They act, um, they act as uh, better conduits for the spread of uh, language um, in, in this kind of social network. Um, but there is uh, there's less evidence um, that uh, you, that Twitter users pay more attention towards local ties uh, when it comes to uh, word adoption. Um, okay, so this is maybe a, before I move on to the other study, this is maybe a time for me to uh, check if there are any questions uh, so far. Um, feel free to ask um, um, if you have any questions. Just a, can I ask a, a quick um, explanation? You, you, you said that close friends are more likely uh, to influence and you, I think, said that the feature for closeness was some uh, otherwise constructed feature. So I know that's not your work, but can you give a, like a one sentence uh, big picture just of what makes somebody close? Yeah, so we measured it uh, through this Adamic Adar index, which basically says that you your connection is strong if you um, share many mutual uh, connections, but these mutual connections have lower degree. So for example, on Twitter, if um, both of you, um, you know, you and um, Atai both mention Barack Obama, um, but Barack Obama is like, you know, mentioned by a lot many other people, so it has high degree. But instead, if you mention, you know, like, um, a user account which is not mentioned by anyone else, then you are in sort of this deeply clustered um, area of the social network. So that's sort of, a strong sort of TFIDF. -ish. Yeah, yeah, basically the idea of TFIDF. Mm -hmm. uh, Sanjib, this is Christina. Uh, yeah. So Davicator is for undirected networks. Did you, so you, this is only looking at mutual type uh, links only, or are you looking at directed, Adamicator for directed networks? In this case, we are, um, we are looking only at the undirected network. So we constructed the network so that um, the, you know, you need to have a mention and a reciprocal mention, only then there exists. A... Right, okay, so you're applying this to the mutual uh, yeah. links, mutual connection. Yeah. Um, okay, and so if there are uh, more questions can be answered later also, but um, move on to the next study, um, which is um, um, you know, which documents are semantically progressive and what, if any, is their impact. Um, and just to give you a backstory, um, this was uh, the work I started doing when I was interning at ISI. Um, and Christina, who was my mentor, um, she had this idea, she was looking at um, legal opinions in US courts, um, and she recognized that there are words like uh, like race, who uh, at some point um, were used at, uh, in a very different way, it was used in the context of horse racing, uh, but then during the, um, during the 60s and especially afterwards, uh, the context in which the word race started using in, uh, in legal opinions um, was in this sort of social sense uh, or like you know, in the um, um, questions related to racial disparity uh, in the US. And so what we wanted to do was, you know, this is an example um, uh, of race is sort of an example of how uh, language changes, uh, but changes in terms of semantics. Um, so like new meanings are attached to known signs um, the signs in the in the language are, are words, for example, uh, and there's this um, famous paper from uh, Will Hamilton on um, how uh, you could use uh, temporal word representations to track uh, semantic shifts uh, in language. Um, so they show this example of the word gay, which changed from this sort of uh, meaning related to happiness or cheer, um, or you know, being cheerful. Uh, to the more sort of homosexual meaning um, that we associate now um, much more than the uh, than the previous meaning. Um, and so the usual way to identify words like uh, like race, uh, gay, which have changed in meaning 
is to follow this general recipe. So you have some sort of model which helps you learn diachronic word embeddings. So like embeddings of every word at um, uh, at different times. Um, and then there is some like procedure so that you can align these embeddings uh, in order to compare them uh, easily. Um, but that's how you sort of learn these representations. Once you have these representations, um, you can start scoring each word for the uh, amount of shift um, that they have undergone. Um, and the basic idea is to quantify sort of the lack of overlap um, in the distributional neighborhood for, for, um, for these words across time slices. So more overlap uh, means the word hasn't changed, less overlap uh, means the word has changed. Um, and then you eventually evaluate um, whether you have identified um, the changes correctly. Or not. So, you know, just to give an example, we applied sort of this recipe on two data sets that we had, um, Google opinions uh, in US courts, uh, the type I mentioned, um, but also scientific abstracts that we had over from 1930 to 2010 um, or 2015 rather. Um, uh, these are computer science options. And you can see words which are interesting and which um, uh, have changed in meaning. So like, for example, the word laundering changes its context from sort of cleaning to sort of laundering funds. Um, and you see this change happening around um, 70s. Um, and there's a reason for that. I think there were sort of uh, laws that were passed um, um, around that time. Um, and this example, which is sort of more easier to understand the word uh, Android, which changed its uh, meaning uh, around 2008 to 2009 um, towards this uh, Android operating system or Android devices. And so the meaning was more uh, related to robotics. Um, so, you know, like following this recipe is, is good. It can help us uh, get to words that have changed in meaning. Um, but what's still missing though is how do you identify documents that are leading that change? So these are the documents that use these words at a time when uh, other documents were using sort of the older meaning. So how do you identify those kind of documents? Um, and the second uh, question is um, if you can identify these leading documents, um, are these uh, documents particularly influential? So just following the, the recipe that I mentioned before uh, is not enough to answer these kind of questions. Um, so we, we sort of, um, you know, in order to plug that gap, we um, came up with this idea of uh, assessing whether every instance of the word is used with a new meaning or old meaning. Um, and so we have the skip cram model, uh, which can give you the probability of the context uh, around the target word. Um, and that's just sort of, you know, you have the model parameters, um, you can just compute this probability. Um, but then you can use these probabilities uh, to calculate log odds ratio. So you have a model, a skip gram model trained on um, uh, documents which are um, the earlier, uh, earlier in time and documents that, uh, that are um, later in time. Um, through these models, you can um, get the probabilities uh, in, in numerator and denominator, um, and you can calculate these odds ratio. Um, and so the idea is um, this sort of instance of, of the word is progressive uh, if this log odds ratio is high, uh, which means that word has been used, aligned more towards the older model uh, than the earlier model. And both these models sort of capture the semantics of words um, at that time. Um, once you get these per instance progressiveness scores, um, you can aggregate them to obtain uh, progressiveness scores for paragraphs, for a um, you know, bunch of paragraphs, even for a document. Um, and so, you know, the kind of examples that we found, uh, which were interesting in both these uh, uh, data sets, we found words like laundering, asylum, fertilization. Um, that are um, that were used in an innovative way in these specific documents. So these were the documents where they were used innovatively before, um, before like other documents started following uh, the usage of um, of these words with a sort of later uh, sense. 
um, and similar sort of you know, examples from uh, from um, the scientific scientific abstracts um, but once you have these documents uh, what we wanted to do was to see whether uh, there is some correlation between the progressiveness scores um, of these documents with the number of citations that these documents get um, and so in both legal opinions and scientific articles um, we have this sort of citation network um, associated with them so it's easy to compute um, how many citations um, any document gets uh, and through our method it's easy to compute uh, the progressiveness um, of these documents um, and you can see in this sort of univariate setup at least um, that there is a very strong correlation in both the data sets uh, as you have more and more progressive documents um, those documents also get more and more citations um, but even uh, in a multivariate setup where you know like citations uh, a document gets citations for for many reasons um, but even after controlling for you know how old the document is how long the document is how many authors um, the document has what is the content of the document um, you know more factors like this um, even after controlling for them progressiveness um, is still very strongly correlated uh, with the number of citations and the number of citations uh, is basically a proxy for how much impact uh, the document had um, so you know being sort of at the cutting edge uh, in terms of language uh, does tend to correlate well with being impactful uh, so do you get a lot of um multi multi-sense documents like i mean aside from a clever like you know money laundering story about money laundering happening at an actual laundry i don't really see many i, I, I it's hard to envision a document that's going to do that um so i think what we found especially with laundering was the earlier sets of opinions focused on small businesses and how um you know like um laundering was um you know small businesses which were uh, um, uh, doing laundering um, but then it's shifted to a financial sense where you saw all kinds of opinions that mentioned like laundering of funds um in sort of financial institutions and in small businesses um lots of other so you're saying the original laundering was was money laundering by small businesses uh no the original in actually washing clothing the original meaning was the washing clothes sense, yeah. which still exists in recent opinions, but not as frequently as um, the sort of money laundering sense. I get that. What I'm saying is, it, within one document, I would, I would, mo like most of the time, expect that that word is used either to mean washing clothes or to mean money, but not both. And thus, your log odds are going to basically be one thing or the other. No. So, um, in a particular document, we don't get. Um, we don't get many instances i don't know for sure how many instances of documents we get uh, but we don't get many instances where a word is used in multiple senses that doesn't stop us from calculating these log odds ratio in the way we want okay uh, because you know the newer model has looked at all the documents that have come later the older uh, model has looked at all documents that has that have come earlier and for any instance of the word all we are doing is saying through this log odds ratio, whether this word is used in a later meaning or an earlier meaning. How are you how are you doing that? So to calculate P new versus P old, then it sounds like you need to pre-tag the words with their either new sense or being used in the new sense or the old sense. So how do you actually calculate build those models to begin with? Yeah, so you you have the context around those words um, and you have the embedding for the context words, you have the embedding for the target word under both the models. Mm. So, well, if you're just using a type-based um, model, then you have one embedding for launder. Yeah, one embedding for everything. Yeah, so, but my point is that if you're going to build that probability, right, you have a corpus. If you want to build P new, you should have a corpus of, of new usage, right? Otherwise, you have one big corpus. So you have to divide it somehow to get the two different models. Yeah, so, yeah, so we, what we did was we divided the original corpus into two halves. Um, one half is, um, you know, what we say is like newer documents. The other half is uh, like older documents. 
um, when you train the model um, on um, older documents, you train another model, a different model on newer documents. Okay, so it's just a temporal divide. Yeah. You use the same temporal divide for all um, for all words. For all words, yes. And there's a, br a bright line, like after 1940, for example, like everything is new and before, not 1940, but whatever. Yeah, or... yeah, it was something I think uh, for legal opinions, um, I think it was something in 1920s or 1930s. And for um, computer science ab abstracts, it was, I think, late 1990s or early 2000s. Okay. Thanks. Okay, and so um, just to summarize this part, um, this sort of idea of um, finding progressive semantic usages have applicability in like other domains. So, uh, you know, this, this gives an ability to sort of zoom into parts of documents, um, get into like instance level progressiveness or like paragraph level progressiveness. Um, and this could be useful in, let's say, for example, let's say digital humanities, where there's this like idea of sort of close reading and uh, distant reading. Um, we never applied that to that domain, but but you know, I think this sort of model could be useful there. Um, and we did find as uh, in the sort of two data sets uh, that we looked at that semantic progressiveness is strongly correlated uh, to the number of citation. Um, but you know, as word of caution here, uh, progressive language use. Um, does not cause the documents to get more citations. We only can say that there is a correlation, but it's not the case that the usage of progressive language um, led to, um, you know, was the direct cause for the documents to, to get more citations. Um, so like probably like, you know, um, the, the causality can uh, also happen in the reverse way. Um, so making a causal claim is not the objective here, but like finding a link between the two um, is definitely interesting and worth uh, investigating more. Okay, so the final study, uh, unless there are uh, more questions around, around the last part. Okay. Um, yeah, the final study uh, takes this idea of finding documents which are progressive or leading uh, and extends it to uh, not just say this at the document level, but at a collection level. So if you have, um, for example, multiple documents from newspaper and there are multiple newspapers, then you want to say which newspapers lead or lag a specific semantic change. Um, and so this is a paper that just came out a couple of weeks back um, on how you can model language change in uh, 19th century activist newspapers to create these like uh, networks um, of these newspapers. Um, and so the newspapers that we considered were uh, these abolitionist newspapers. So abolitionism for people who don't know um, was a mid 19th century movement um, in the United States to end slavery. Um, that was the common objective. Um, this was also a movement which really brought a um, lot of people together towards this objective. Um, for example, this was, um, I think, one of the first times when um, a woman took a very active role in US politics. Um, so it's a important period um, for, you know, like multiple reasons. Um, and it's a common knowledge that a bunch of these abolitionist newspapers, which played a very important part in shaping the discourse over, um, over time during this sort of, um, you know, bef just before the, the civil war started. Um, and so in the study, we had access to um, this archive from um, called Accessible Archives, uh, which digitizes all these newspapers um, so that you can use them in text form um, for any study. Okay, and so, you know, just to, just to do sort of the usual thing, um, we wanted to check whether uh, in this period, whether there are instances of changes in meaning. Um, and so this is an example of um, the word cabinet, which changes um, even in the short amount of time from, um, you know, more architectural sense or like, you know, this sort of like a cabinet as a room uh, towards like a cabinet in government. Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, the original meaning is lost uh, um, and this new meaning didn't exist in 1830s. 
um, it's probably the case that um, the sort of sense become more prolific um, and uh, become less prolific in, in these two different areas. So the next question to ask is, you know, can these semantic uh, changes tell us about the relationships between uh, abolitionist newspapers? So in particular, uh, in particular, who leads, uh, who follows, and who's an outsider um, uh, in, this, in this change process? Um, so just to give you an overview, like we decompose, our objective is to take the diachronic text and um, come up with a semantic leadership network uh, between these uh, newspapers. Um, and the overall methodology can be um, decomposed into a series of steps, um, you know, from identifying semantic changes to identifying who is, uh, who, which newspapers are leaders of individual changes, and then aggregating them to like construct a network. And then finally, like analysis on this uh, aggregated network. Um, so just to give you a, like uh, an idea of individual um, uh, you know, the technical uh, challenges or you know, technicalities in the individual steps. Um, the first step is to learn these sort of diachronic embeddings. Um, and we use this model, um, which was developed by David Bamman um, and others a few years back um, and adapted for our setting. The idea is you have um, a representation for a word at, at some time t that can be decomposed into a uh, sort of a temporal embedding. So, you know, uh, embedding, which is sort of base embedding, it doesn't depend on the uh, on the timestamp. And then you add some residue um, on that base uh, embedding um, that converts the base embedding to a time specific embedding for a word. Um, and you can keep on doing this. Um, you can add sort of another residue, which takes into consideration the, the source or the newspaper. Um, and now you get uh, embedding for the word at, at time t um, for some newspaper S. Yes. Um, so this is not a very complicated model. These embeddings and these deviations can be learned by optimizing just the word to work objective. Um, and we first use the temporal only model to identify what uh, semantic changes have happened. Um, and then um, we learn another model um, that uh, introduces the source specific deviation also. Okay, and, and so you know you train the model on, on this data, um, and you see uh, you come up with these like words that are changed in meaning and the specific time period in which this change um, is most distinct. Um, and so a few a few sort of interesting patterns here. We see terms uh, changing from you know like an abstract meaning to a more concrete meaning, um, but also words which go the other way around. So like they start uh, with a concrete meaning but then become more and more abstract. Um, but a lot of these words also sort of proxy the discourse shift um, over the years. Um, so we also have words uh, which are everyday words, but they're used in like, for example, the word um, arms, um, but these uh, words are used in different uh, discourses. And so really it tells you like how the focus shifted uh, over the years um, in this debate. Uh, Okay, so if you have identified a word that has changed, um, then you can use the conditioned diachronic embeddings, uh, conditioned on the newspaper, to come up with this sort of metric um, that says uh, whether a particular newspaper leads or lags. Um, so we have for every word, um, the time period in which it has changed. Um, and let's say we have two newspapers. The idea is to compute uh, um, uh, autocorrelation um, between a newspaper for two different times um, and cross correlation um, between two newspapers at those two different times. Um, so the cross correlation goes in the numerator, the autocorrelation goes in the denominator. Um, and the idea is that newspaper S1 leads newspaper S2 um, if this value is high. And so the basic intuition again is um, this newspaper S2 used a different sense of the word at time t1 um, in comparison to t2. Um, but this other newspaper S1 used the uh, used sort of a sense which was more similar uh, to the sense that eventually uh, newspaper S2 followed. And if that's happening, then we can say like the newspaper uh, S1 is leading newspaper S2. Um, 
Um, so you can calculate this lead, but uh, one of the problems that we have, and this is perhaps the case in um, lots of other data sets of this kind uh, or that have this structure, is um, newspapers publish at different rates um, and they, they publish in different periods. Um, so if you can see this sort of plot shows that they're active in different periods. Um, and this can confound our um, sort of measure of lead or like who we say is leading and who's, who we say is lagging because inevitably the newspapers who would come later in the, uh, in the cycle are uh, going to be followers uh, and the ones who come early are going to be leaders and we don't want, we don't just want that to happen. Um, so what we did was we um, randomized the data by like swapping tokens across the newspapers. Um, and retaining only those uh, leadership uh, events um, that are statistically significant um, even after this randomization. Right. Um, and so once we have pairs of newspapers uh, which, um, which are retained even after this sort of statistical um, testing, um, then we can construct these newspaper uh, network um, and, and sort of start analyzing them. Um, so this is sort of the overall view of uh, the types of newspapers that we had and, uh, it, uh, and how many times they were leaders uh, and how many times they were followers. Uh, and just like these two um, uh, plots show um, a sort of a highlighted view of when the uh, newspapers had black editors as leaders um, and when they had uh, black editors as followers. Um, and you can see so patterns emerge from here. Like for example, the provincial freeman turns out to be a strong leader, whereas um, papers that were edited by um, Frederick Douglass uh, tend to be uh, leaders as well as followers. Um, what do the colors mean in those graphs? Um, sorry, say that again? What do the colors mean? Oh, um, Every newspaper is given a different color, uh, but in this case, what we are doing is just uh, sort of popping the newspapers which uh, had black editors. Um, and so in a different color scheme, now you would see um, newspapers which had female editors. And again, you see like uh, newspapers like the Lily, Goldie's Lady's Book, um, they were um, uh, the strong leaders but uh, Godi's Lady's book um, was also as much as a follower as it was a leader. Um, and just to, you know, just to say a little bit more about this, this has Im important implications in, uh, in sort of humanity scholarship. Um, I think a lot of um, attribution to the importance of these newspapers were given to popular newspapers um, and uh, newspapers which were edited by um, black editors or female editors were given much less importance. But what this sort of um, 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 analysis is suggesting is they were also equally important, um, or if not more important. Um, and just to sort of drive this point home, once we have constructed this network, um, we uh, applied page rank so that we could associate an important score with each, each of these newspapers. Um, but one problem with page rank is it gives you one number per newspaper. And so it's hard to differentiate uh, between a leader, a follower, and a non-participant. Um, so we also applied this uh, uh, HITS algorithm, um, which, um, which gives you the so-called hubs and authority scores um, that can clearly separate leaders, followers, and outsiders. And you can see the newspapers like the Lily, uh, Gori's Ladies Book, uh, provincial freemen turn out to have higher authority scores, so overwhelmingly leaders. Uh, but a newspaper like uh, National Anti Slavery Standard, which is much more popular, turns out to be a, a follower in these semantic changes. Um, whereas you have the Christian Recorder, which, um, which you know, is neither a leader nor a follower. Um, and so this sort of network analysis does delineate all these different roles these newspapers play. Okay, so to summarize, like our uh, method in this uh, reaffirms like what are known leaders, you know, the popular ones, the liberator, um, and the known followers like National Anti-Slavery Standard, but it also brings into focus the leadership of black editors and female editors, 
um, in changing the discourse around slavery at that time. Um, and hopefully this is like the first um, study of multiple uh, that can zoom into more into what um, what specifically like were their roles. Okay, so um, to wrap up, uh, sort of summarizing all these talks, um, you know, contributions that we were able to make uh, through these three studies, like, you know, uh, point process models, which can scale to millions of users, how to extend diachronic word embedding models, um, so that we can go beyond finding just what has changed. Um, we also were able to like have these sort of measures for progressiveness of documents or leadership between pairs of newspapers. Um, and through all this sort of modeling and analysis, we were also able to draw a few linguistic insights. For example, that change in a social network uh, takes a form, language change in a social network takes a form of contagion, um, and also sort of um, linguistic innovation, uh, innovativeness or linguistic leadership uh, does get you more citations. So it has some, some impact. Um, so I have five more minutes and I'll briefly go through sort of what I see as future opportunities in this space. Um, and I sort of have three bullet points um, of what can be done, um, 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 you know, building on, on sort of language change work um, that we have done. Um, so the first is to go beyond sort of lexical change uh, in uh, doing this uh, network dynamic study. Um, so as you remember in the first study, we only had these like word, um, one word and how it propagated in a network. But we can go beyond that, especially now since we have a lot of, we can use like a lot of NLP methods um, on um, large scale data. Um, and so this is uh, some work uh, that we uh, recently started um, at Georgia Tech on uh, identifying uh, hate speech and counter hate speech um, on Twitter, um, especially around uh, COVID-19 uh, discourse. Um, and then once you have sort of high accuracy classifiers that can tell you whether this is hate speech, whether this is counter hate speech, uh, you can start um, analyzing, um, you know, whether uh, if you're if you're exposed to hate speech, are you more likely to adopt hate speech, or if you're exposed to counter hate speech, are you um, more likely to um, drop hate speech? Um, and so this sort of contagion studies, they're um, you know they're very standard, um, but they're only possible if you go beyond if you if you start using more NLP methods to um, identify sort of so constructs that we are interested in. Um, and like hate speech is one example of that kind. Um, and this, you know, I think still, still um, you know, more work to be done on the NLP side, of course, for the study, but it gives you an idea of like, you know, and the, the hate speech uh, Twitter users are at least sort of these clustered users. So more hate exposures they get, um, they are uh, more likely to adopt hate. Um, whereas, um, but, you know, counter hate speech does play uh, a, a small role in like mitigating hate speech um, through all these plots. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, this paper is on archive. Feel free to uh, to check it out. Um, the second one is sort of improving um, the modeling and robustness uh, in detecting semantic changes. Um, so as um, John pointed out, um, some of these models that um, detect semantic changes use type level embeddings. Uh, but now we have contextual embeddings, which is like, you know, uh, much more powerful than the static embeddings. Um, and some work has already started using contextual embeddings to identify semantic changes, um, but they have to do a few more tricks. They have to identify different word senses through some clustering methods and then see if clusters are changing. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here to like not do um, those kind of uh, things, but to use sort of non-parametric methods based on sort of kernel uh, similarity um, to detect semantic changes. Um, but a bigger question here is the ability to distinguish between different types of semantic changes. So not just whether one word sense has, um, um, has been overtaken by some other word sense, but also if like, you know, the meaning has become narrower or it has broadened um, or it has uh, reduced in intensity. 
Um, so these are more subtle shifts which like existing methods are not able to differentiate clearly. Um, and finally, um, you know, the work on abolitionist new, uh, networks was sort of the first step at uncovering uh, latent relations um, between the newspapers. And so we had this sort of pipelined way of identifying semantic changes and then constructing a network. But we have more principled approaches, like, and I talked about this multivariate Hox process, which is kind of a point process models, where we can infer a network based on like instances of usage. Um, and so integrating so contextual models for language change, um, as we talked about in the previous uh, um, slide, um, and these point process models can give you a much more sort of granular and deeper insight into, uh, into the social dynamics that are uh, at play. Um, so with that, I'll stop uh, right on time. Uh, I just wanted to thank my advisor, Jacob Eisenstein, and lots of collaborators who have helped me with, uh, with data, with, uh, uh, with brainstorming the ideas, and um, you know, working on some of those ideas together. Um, and also a big thank you to for like always having my back to all the members of uh, Computational Linguistics Lab at Georgia Tech. Um, and uh, with that, I'll wrap up and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandy. Thank you for the great talk. And I think I can open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? I actually have, uh, Christina, you uh, turned your video on. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was in general. We, we are going to talk more later, but maybe just, is it possible to even quantify quickly the changes, the language changes happening? You know, is it just me that seems like things are happening? And, you know, the, the pace of language change is accelerating or is it just, you know, my perception is that something can be quantified. Uh, you mean the pace of language change? Yep. Um, yeah, uh, so far I haven't looked at that in particular, but I have come across a few papers. Um, I want to say uh, researchers in Cambridge, um, I think um, Andrea Baron Kelly, if I get his name correct, um, who looked at this problem of uh, like finding sort of the velocity of change. Mm -hmm. um, he had uh, sort of a differential systems model mm -hmm. where you can where you can track or where we have a better idea of um, how fast some change is happening um, but that's an interesting question and I do know there is work out there um, that's something that I haven't uh, looked at um, but if I find that paper I'm happy to share that okay yeah, cool um, so uh, in the last section you talked about um, uh, these uh, the temporal embeddings and being and separating the temporal component from the base component. Um, was that done in a top-down way? Like, do you, in the input, do you have like, you know, again, using launder, launder underscore old versus launder underscore new, or like, did you put the year in or is that learned, the temporal component? Yeah, that's a good question. So in this case, with the, um, with the, with this kind of a model, you don't have to divide, um, well, you do have to divide, but you don't have to um, say what is old or what is new. Mm -hmm. um, you basically just have a different um, a time slice marker for every division of the corpus that you have. Okay, so it's coming from the, the data itself is indicating. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and what's, what's good about it is now you don't have to do any sort of post hoc alignment step. Um, everything is learned jointly. Um, so every embedding across uh, time steps is comparable. Um, and you can go beyond, you can, as I said, like you could incorporate other features, um, you know, if you have locations, um, Reddit community ID, you can have specific embeddings uh, for them. But even beyond that, and like, you know, maybe this is going over and above the question that you asked, um, this is just a linear model. You can add non-linearities um, to this model also. Um, this is this is overlay, right? Not concatenation. The plus indicator, right? Um, say that again. The, this is this is the, the the embeddings themselves are added together, not concatenated together. Added together, yes. 
Yes. What, how many, um, or what were your time slices that you used in this work? Um, so this was um, a period of between 1827 to 1865, uh, and we had 10, 10 time slices um, of the same length. Same temporal. Same temporal length, yeah. Do you have fewer data in the earlier years? Or is we do have fewer data in the earlier years. Um, that's because more newspapers were active from like after 1950s. Um, I think um, I do have, yeah. So I think this plot will show you um, that you have um, less newspapers which were active before um, 1850. Um, but more and more getting active after 1850. Um, yeah, and so that's again, like, you know, through our sort of randomization step, we were careful so that frequency isn't a factor in just saying that someone is a leader or a follower. Thank you. Uh, I also had a question. So mm -hmm. specifically regarding document progressiveness, uh, mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, you have these divisions that uh, after this point, you calculate the embedding for the new sense. And before that, you calculate the embedding for the old sense. And if they end up being the same, it basically means that the word didn't change sense. But if these are different, it means that the word did change sense. In that case, I'm interested to know that I understand that it's correlation and not causation in the sense that uh, progressiveness doesn't be doesn't bring you more citations, but isn't it a causation the other way around? In a sense that the more citation you get, it means that uh, the more causation you get, and make the word end up being progressive. In the sense that the more citations you get, it means more documents cite you and they are likely to use the word in the sense that you use and just that that brings more documents that use that word in that new sense and the word and ends up having a new embedding i'm interested to know if this is a good way to put it that it's actually a causation the other way around if you because if i use a word in a new sense and nobody cites me that word embedding won't change. But if many people cite me, I was actually the person who initiated the word sense change. Yeah, no, so as, yeah, so that's the reason why, you know, I, I said like causality can be the other way um, or like in the reverse direction. Um, it can also be in this direction that we are talking about that actually in some cases, progressive language use does uh, get you more citations. Um, so for example, you know, um, some paper, you know, paper introduced uh, latent Dirichlet allocation and used LDA as the short form. Um, well, you can imagine like, you know, that paper getting more citations just because they introduced a very different concept. Um, but, you know, there are like other papers which maybe came around the same time and made it a point of using that abbreviation. Um, they would also like, you know, because it was easy for people to understand that um, these papers are related and they're, they're on the same sort of topic. Um, and they, that sort of adoption of that terminology can also boost um, the number of citations that you can get. But as you said, you know, like the more popular the paper becomes, then people start adopting the terminology that, um, that uh, they introduce um, or they use. Um, and that in turn means that you start uh, using progressive language. Um, so I think there is sort of a, you know, cycle, um, cause, um, causal cycle here. Um, and it's an open question of how to sort of tease that apart. Um, but, you know, I, I can see uh, it happening in both the directions. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Hi, um, I have a question uh, regarding something similar to the last question. So um, you have worked on both social media data and uh, documentation data from uh, news uh, resources, which is a more standard way of language use. Well, as for social media, 
there are a lot of, let's say, uh, emergence of synchronous and uh, new ways of using the languages. So the question is basically, do you find any uh, noteworthy um, stuff when you are using social media data that the standard embedding methods may work or not work in a specific uh, scenario? Um, just uh, because of the non-standard usage of language. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, uh, the question is um, whether um, some of the methods that I used for more sort of standard data, could they be used um, on let's say social media where there are lots of non-standard usages? Um, is, is, that the, is that the question? Yeah. Okay, um, so the I haven't really looked at um, sort of these embedding methods applied to um, to social media so far. So if you like remember in the first study, we only were looking at the word itself, irrespective of whether that word is used in multiple senses. Um, so we don't know how um, how well um, these embedding methods at least work um, work there. Um, in principle, I do think if we have uh, enough usages of, of these words, um, we should be able to uh, apply these embedding models there. Um, and for example, the sort of work that I cited from David Bauman was actually um, on Twitter data. Uh, it's just instead of this temporal dimension, they introduced a geographical dimension to learn geographic location specific embeddings. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, that's kind of evidence that some of these methods uh, could be applied. Um, and I think there is more evidence uh, to like, you know, using these sort of multi hoax process. Um, they have been applied in all kinds of scenarios, not just uh, social media um, data. I think it's, you don't even, it doesn't even have to be uh, anything related to text to apply um, um, HP kind of models. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thanks. Do we have any other questions? Um, I remember you talking about controlling for the documents uh, for a fair comparison, um, and you still have the same results. And then I remember you mentioning that you've also controlled for the document content. Um, what was the actual process for controlling the document content? Yeah, so um, what we did, if I recall correctly, is uh, we had um, built a, a regressor which would um, use um, or which would represent every document as a bag of words um, and then try to predict the number of citations the document would get. Um, and this prediction then was used as a, um, as like a, a, a covariate in, um, in the, in the regression that mm -hmm. controls for other things. Oh, okay. Um, I yeah. see that makes sense. All right. Thank you. Do we have any other questions uh, from the audience? Okay, great. Uh, in that case, thanks again, Sandeep, for the talk. Uh, very interesting. It also, uh, a lot of great discussions happened. Uh, thank you for that. And with that, I think we can give you a break before uh, the one-on-one -on -one start. Thank you so much for the questions and thank you so much for having me. Great. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great rest of your day.